My name is Joe Punganivan, and I'm the Director of, Enga of Community Engagement at Little Kids Rock. Thank you for joining us for the second installment of our monthly teacher, teacher expert series. This series will be focusing on the incredibly important topic of inclusion and equity within the classroom. Little Kids Rock continues to underline the importance of having equitable and inclusive learning environments to celebrate each and every one of our students. We're really excited to bring together four incredible educators who we know have had remarkable passion in and out of the classroom. All four of these individuals have definitely moved the needle, engaging in conversation and educating others on the importance of today's topic. First up, we have Mia Ibrahim. She is a high school music educator and department head at, in the South Bronx of New York, specializing in music and queer education. She has a long history of working in marginalized communities, ranging from music therapy apprenticeships at rehabilitation centers and brain injury centers in the Bay Area of California, to working to TGNCI and LGBTQ plus incarcerated and community, school community members in the New York, New York area. Next, we have Alice Tsui. She is a founding music teacher at an arts integrated elementary school in Brooklyn, New York. She is an Asian American pianist, uh, music educator, and activist. As a product of the New York City public school system, she is passionate about decolonizing anti-racist, abolitionist public music education and empowering the individual and collective voices of youth through music as expression. Next, we have Ashley Shabankare. She is a musician, arts administrator, and music education and creative economy advocate. Ashley serves as a collaborative action strategist for Artist Core New Orleans, Director of Learning and Development for Upbeat Academy Foundation, and the Education Specialist for the New Orleans Jazz Museum. Lastly, moderating tonight's panel is Latasha Castrolo Lala. She is the Supervisor of Visual and Performing Arts and a proud product of Passaic Public Schools. Formerly a music teacher and assistant principal, she has helped revive theater arts programs introduced arts integration, and implemented modern band and CTE arts programs in the district. Feel free to throw in your questions in the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen, and we'll be sure to answer them at the end. Take it away, Latasha. So welcome, welcome everyone. I am so excited to be with this incredible panel of experts in our amazing field. So ladies, we're just gonna jump right in um, and start with one of our first questions. Um, our first question is, what do you see as being the biggest barriers to achieving equity in music education? Anyone can feel free to jump on in. Are we rock, paper, scissoring at the start? <laughs> Go! Woo! <laughs> uh, I was gonna start by saying, I think there, this is a, a layered question um, and there are many, many deep layers to why there are barriers to bringing equity into our schools. I think from the jump, I'm gonna start off with like our teacher training that we are all provided with. As music educators, when we go through our training programs, we are provided with a very colonized format of music education, a very colonized view of how we teach, how we approach. And if we are stuck in the same mindset and continue to perpetuate this mindset, we are not going to create equity. We are being taught the same methods that have been taught for generations and generations of this field. Um, so to start, it's our it's our training itself. We aren't necessarily taught the toolkit of how to provide equity to our students when we are going through this process. Um, and I feel like I should like rock, paper, scissor over to <laughs> Mia or Alice. <laughs> Cause I can see some head nods going and I know that one of them can <laughs> tag off of this really well. <laughs> I mean, definitely like, Ashley, you crushed it. That's totally it. And I was gonna say tradition, like, Right, that's exactly what it is, is the, the way we view traditional music education in America specifically, like if you look at how music is being taught around the world, if you look at how music is taught in different eras, different time periods, it's, it's not this like uniform one off, but then that's what we've adapted into music ed and that's what we teach to our college students, right? That's what music education has become. So it's just like breaking free of that is, made even more difficult because our NAFME standards are actually catered to 
those exact traditions that are really problematic and rooted in westernized music, right? Music traditions that don't respect and honor all cultures and I and every and everyone in our room, right? I know Atlas has plenty to say about this too. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go real deep, real fast right now. Um, I think I'm going to approach it a little bit differently. I think the biggest barrier is denial and refusal to have introspection throughout one's teaching career. So we are currently in a trend of let's add on how much, uh, as much equitable things in the classroom as we can. We have now toured this country, we've done it. We have now said Black Lives Matter, we've done it. And I think that we have just like barely, you know, that iceberg image where it's like, we are just chipping at the iceberg and we're not looking at ourselves in our everyday lens. Like how do I walk in the world and what are my own lens in looking at life? Let's forget music education for a moment, looking at life, the things that I experience. And then what does that then shape in terms of my teaching and then how are my students affected by it and then just like the cycle of introspection so I think that there's often a denial that that is one necessary and two needs to continue happening and like oh. on that too Alice just real quickly is our students pick up on how we live our lives outside of the classroom and I don't think everyone is intuitive enough, enough to like realize that I think a lot of us here are definitely like very aware but I, at the same time like it's really difficult to process like even without social media even without all these other like word of mouth and gossiping like students pick up on that they know how you act outside the classroom and how it's affecting them I, I just have to piggyback. I loved what y'all just said. Like, I'm just like dropping mics, dropping mics all over here. This is incredible. And I think, you know, I want to piggyback on what Alice said. I think um, it's really about the stories that we are trying to tell, right? Music tells the story of a world, right? And if we speak about music education in the United States, we stop, we pretend that music education stops at 1940. And so I always think about it as never what you say, but what you don't say. So if you say that music education stops at 1940, then everything that's happened since that point to the present day isn't valuable. So what you don't teach, you send the message that it lacks value. And if you are, depending on any group that you're in or music that you enjoy, you like, you then send the message that that, you fill in the blank, is invaluable. Um, and if you're doing that, then how are we possibly being equitable? <laughs> because you're now, discrediting um, people, um, events, culture, climate. And um, I think that is like, it's something I know for my own district that we, we took a really hard look at because it was just like, oh my gosh, like I don't mean to, but we totally send that. If it's not in our classrooms, people, parents, administrators, children think it's not important. So, you know, really looking at the fact as what are we teaching and if it's excluded and not one class fully integrated into the work that we do. Um, if we really teach all music, because then we're making judgments about what is and what isn't. All right, I'm, I'm off mine. This, this is just so we have to have more time. Y'all. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about, um, let's just identify one issue. Uh, what are, what's an issue uh, relating to equity in the classroom that you've experienced in your own practice? I mean, I told you I'm all about the queer education. Like, it's been a roller coaster getting there. It is fighting tooth and nail to get there. And like you said, Latasha, it's now mandated. So I had administration fight me because, you know, it's not always well received with parents. It's not always well received with communities, with school communities. And suddenly it becomes about, it becomes personal, right? Because as a queer woman, me being vulnerable with my students and just dis discussing this openly with them, all of a sudden it becomes, oh, well, my teacher is turning my, their teacher is turning my child gay. Like I've had that accusation before, like just like the curriculum can somehow sway somebody and the, the like, 
theory that it's still a choice. I don't know how it's still, mm -hmm. it's still like permeated in our society that like, oh, this is the lifestyle people choose and calling it a lifestyle. I mean, just all of it. Um, it's really, it's been really tough, but we, we got there and it's really, it's been great. You know me, I'm good on wait time, y'all. <laughs> I was going full rock, paper, scissors again. Don't mind me. <laughs> this is how I operate my own personal Zoom meetings. This <laughs> rock, paper, scissors still, apparently. Uh, Alice, I feel like you should go first since you're still currently in the classroom. So many things. Um, so many things. I, I'm just personally struggling to just pinpoint or try to narrow down. Um, I personally, as an educator, and this is um, just speaking as an Asian American person, have had experiences of anti-Asian racism. And at the same time, I try to often navigate what that means as I advocate for my students who are black and brown. And I think that it's such a tricky spot um, on a day-to-day -day because especially at the height of the pandemic in, in April, May, um, it was like almost a battle of, well, today I feel safer, but tomorrow my students might not feel as safe. So why do I have to continuously navigate what that feels like and, and is like? Um, I mean, I can't, I, I can go into like just what it was like when when George Floyd and unfortunately so many others were killed, murdered, and what immediate effect that had on my students. Um, and it's it's just yeah, it's it's all of that, and it's continuous. Um, you know, the election is over, and we feel some sense of safety and hope, but the racism doesn't stop there. So I think that just continuing to, to navigate what that looks like for students and being able to have them use music to advocate for their voice, the importance of their lives. Um, it's been very important to me to, to be very current with what music has been released, personally listening to it, personally making sure that students are able to access it as well, and, and just know that they can also create based on what they feel and experience, and that is valid. And like for all the other educators too, like anti-darkness can happen without darkness in the room as Bettina Love puts it, right? Like even if their classrooms don't look like ours, Alice, it, like it's still, it can happen. I, I also wanted to bring up the, the big piece of intersectionality. I feel like a, something that we don't talk about a lot as music educators is we know we say diversity, we say equity, but we don't think about these things as intersectional issues. They are. We can't say that we are only one aspect of our identities. And I, you know, as a, a Middle Eastern woman, like, I mean, I'm a, a cisgendered woman, but, you know, like, at, I think about just the intersections that exist there. And then the intersections of being a, a not a native New Orleanian and what sort of challenges those present to me living and working in New Orleans and working with predominantly black students and the challenges that, yes, we may have some intersectional things that occur between the way that we are treated as individuals, but are the way that these things represent themselves are not the same. And I, I think it's just something that we don't always think about when we think about equity. We don't think, talk about intersectionality and we need to do more of that. that like that that's so dope in my head like that is all that you're saying is so critical because the idea of placing children right adults in boxes neat little boxes where we don't all fit and looking at it's holistic in that one box doesn't fit every child just because they identify in one way or another. Um, and I think that really speaks a lot to, to the work that as educators we need to do when it comes to cultural responsive teaching, right? Because culturally responsive teaching is not just about the race of the child, it's not just for brown and black children. The premise is on getting to know who you are serving. 
and what they need. And I, I think that it's just like, well, they're children and they're eight and eight-year-olds are in grade two. And we come from that perspective versus what are all the beautiful things that our students bring into the day-to-day? -day? What do they have that we can utilize to make better connections? Um, and and that as arts-based teachers, I know that that can be challenging because some of us see our students once a week. <laughs> and you know, some of our, our, our of us see our students a couple of times or for a semester or possibly even every day. But how do we connect that and connect it like beyond just our art form, but to how our or art form connects to life? Um, because for some of our students, it's our art form that brings them through and carries them and gives them hope. Um, and, and that's what we hope uh, to do and to teach them, um, not just from an enjoyment perspective, but from a creative perspective as well. Uh, so tell me a little bit about some feedback. Um, what's the feedback in the work that each of you do that you receive, possibly from teachers, from your colleagues, of course, um, parents, um, administrators, um, about some of these issues and how you're doing it? I know like Mia, you spoke that you had a lot of uh, interesting conversations with <laughs> administrators. Um, tell me a little bit about that feedback and, and how did you work with them um, and support them in understanding the rich perspective that you offer? So like you discussed earlier, like these young children, how are we reaching out to them? When I worked at an elementary middle school, I started a GSA there. Like I'm not gonna let the age group stop me from being inclusive. Like that's not a barrier that we should ever consider. That's Gen that's ageism, right? Like um, um, Pride and Less Prejudice is an amazing organization that like gives free LGBTQ plus books to teachers who teach pre-K through third grade. Like go sign up now, you can get some free books. Like it's it should be from a young age, we teach these kids and we teach them to accept and love one another regardless. Um, so I'm, a, I'm like a staunch believer of that. And of course there was pushback at um, the young age, with the young age group. It's um, Pride and Less Prejudice is the name of the group. Um, and I can put it in the chat after this, but I, I got a lot of pushback because of the age group and everything. I had Leslie Lohman Museum of Art um, is a gay and lesbian art museum in, the, in Manhattan. And I had them do like a workshop with my kids and we met our first non-binary person at such a young age and they like learned how to use the pronouns like all of that is so important um and when i got pushback from my administration i think it's really important to know your rights i they make us be teachers and lawyers sometimes and that sucks but um title nine does protect you so like if a administrator or a parent does come at you and say like i don't want my child participating or i don't want this in my school, Title IX will, thank you, Latasha, um, Title IX protects you guys, like it protects y'all and it, um, it makes it so that a student can live their identity um, free of discrimination in the school building, within the school walls, they are safe and protected. And that is it, within the school walls, 100% protected. So you don't need to tell them, the, tell the parent the preferred name or preferred pronouns outside of the school walls. You have no obligation to discuss the um, club participation if it's happening during school hours. You are under no obligation to disclose this to parents or have these discussions if they make you uncomfortable because Title IX does protect us, which is really cool. Like, that's fabulous. I have to tell you that, thank you for that resource because I was like, right, and let's, I was going in because I think that I have I have three young children. Well, they're not young. They're they're middle school children, um, 11, um, 11 and twelve. And the amount of stories that I hear from my own children, um, from friends, like the last one we heard was over during the pandemic. One of the young ladies was kicked out. I'm like, we're in a pandemic. There's and forty no percent of homeless youth are kids who right. are LGBTQ plus identifying. Like that's almost half of kids who lose their home or don't have a home who are displaced are yeah. LGBTQ kids who came out and were displaced from their homes. That's a crazy statistic. That is. I mean, and all children need to be supported. And, and, and I think that the challenge is of course, as educators, right? Everyone's entitled to their principles and beliefs, but our goal is to educate and support children. That's, that's what we do every day, 
remotely, in person, hybrid, during the summer, during the winter. That's what we do. And supporting a student is supporting them, whatever that is. Right. And we need to make sure that we're doing that and using the content to show that support and educate them regardless, because we're here to educate. Alice, did you have something you wanted to add? I just want to say that I am very lucky to be in a school that with super supportive colleagues and administration. I know it's like a golden star that I found um, somewhere in this universe. Um, but interestingly, we have had pushback on social media. So I help manage um, school. The school social media and sometimes when we do post songs that literally just speak to the fact that black lives do indeed matter and that we advocate for the use of our voices um we will get our a friend from somewhere in america that will just say that has no connection to the school and it's happened a couple of times um who, who will just message and or comment and say that this is garbage and that they would be very afraid for their child to go to such a school. Um, to which I just say, you know, too bad, so sad. And I, I just don't care because what I, I know that our, what our kids are and who they are matters and it doesn't matter what anyone else says. So that's that. I guess I'll just add, I am in a, a bit of a different situation since I work for nonprofits. But what I can say is that I am always struck by how students find our music programs, especially community-based music programs. And there is a reason why there are still so many community-based music programs. Students don't feel a sense of connection in their music classrooms. And you can see that in music programs, especially or rather in some nonprofit community programs like ours, our program is driven in music technology and production. And the students that are joining our programs are coming from schools that did not value their culture, did not value what they wanted to do as artists. And you know, that's the a really big piece that I, I think it's worth noting. We have to remember that if they're not in your classroom finding that support, they're gonna find it somewhere else. And those spaces are going to exist for them. Uh, I, I just want to like reiterate that as well is that community organizations like myself were there <laughs> to, to pick up those pieces and, and to help support. Ashley, you're absolutely correct because I, I think you're right. Um, we're, I'm in a community, um, urban community with students. We have a diverse uh, population and we, infuse uh, music technology and production in our program, it, it's, we don't have enough space right now. <laughs> like, I got to figure out how to buy, build a new lab because the students are coming in droves. And I think you're absolutely right that for communities that are fortunate enough to have these community-based organizations to support, you're right. There's a part that we're missing. Um, you know, there's this amazing um, phrase that David Wish always, he, he says this statistic that, you know, 100% of our kids are listening to music, but we know that they're 100% are not participating in our programs. And for me, I don't need 100, but I do like 25%. 25% seems really great, right? But I don't have 25%. So what am I missing? What am I not offering? And as musicians, you know, the goal is that our students, we should be looking at saying, well, what are you interested in? Because we get 100% of them at the lower grades. And by the time we edge on up to that middle school, high school, we're not even remotely close to that 100. And offering a variety of options, not just quote unquote traditional options, a multitude of options. I always think of enrollment is enrollment. I'll take it how I can get it. So if you're a songwriter, I need you. If you just play uh, the marimbas, I need you too. If you play a guitar, I need you. If you don't do any of that and you rap, I need that. You only do lighting. We need somebody who could do lights. We need everything. And just the idea of how much could we do something to support and assist and, and help to bridge that gap that it's not one dimensional. The whole point of music is that it's never meant to be one dimensional. It's supposed to be multidimensional and reach and teach and and that's why there's so many different genres and new ones like the one we just heard tonight. Like, it keeps going because there's more and we've got to as educators keep reaching out 
and, and, and reach to get more of our students involved. Because you're right, they'll find it. Um, and we hope and we pray that they find it positively. Right, that's the goal. All right, tell me a little bit about um, distance. We are in the middle of this global pandemic. Um, we're trying to still do our gigs. Um, I know some folks are remote uh, fully. Some people are in person fully. Some people are hybrid or navigating through this with unfortunately the rising numbers. Um, tell me a little bit about how this remote or hybrid environment has changed how you've approached um, issues of race or um, gender or sexual orientation, disability in your work um, with students in music. I just wanna jump in and say, it shouldn't change the way that you provide equitable practices, period, and a story. Um, so, I'm just going to start there. Uh, <laughs> Mike's <laughs> again. Mm, uh, uh, but the, the big thing I think on our end as a music technology based program, the challenge for us was figuring out what music technology and rather what technology our kids had so that if they didn't have technology, we literally could provide them with it and that we could figure out what worked for them, what program worked for them and go in that route. And I'm sorry, my cat keeps coming into the screen today. She, she decides she's in this, she wants to let y'all know about it too. Um, <laughs> but that was, honestly, that was the biggest challenge for us. And if figuring out technology was the biggest challenge for us, then so be it. I will take that any day. Um, honestly, I feel like we've had this really amazing opportunity that we've figured out even further what kids connect with online learning more than they did in person and finding these different avenues and ways to connect them with learning. I think that has been really revealing for me as an educator. And I, I as reference, I was a former classroom teacher. So this has been a really revealing time for me in a lot of levels. Um, and aside from that, you know, in New Orleans, we are continuing to be in a really weird state. We are a 100% charter school system. Every charter school has their own level of autonomy. So for my colleagues in New Orleans, this is incredibly challenging because a lot of them are not being able to teach music, period. They are being asked to be paras. They are being asked to essentially be like the hand holders on Zoom and mute people. And for us, like we are really trying to advocate for making sure music comes back because it is tied to our SPS scores here in New Orleans. So that's its own level of complicated. I could go down that train for a while, but I'm going to pass from there. <laughs> so I'm teaching in person, remote, hybrid, all of the above, everything that you can think of, basically. Um, and it, aside from the fact that I'm just tired 24 seven times a million, um, for for hybrid learning, a lot of, uh, sorry, I should say remote learning when we are on Zoom, I always try to provide opportunities for all students to have their voices heard. So that, that involves both like typing in the chat all the way to um, call and response. So I have gotten very quick with mute, unmute, um, and mute not as a way of silence, but just as a way to give directions um, and unmute as I want to hear your voice. Um, I've also normalized that embracing the lag is okay. And now we just laugh about it when it does happen, but it is, it is just the way it is and that's okay. And for both in person and remote, I have made it very intentional that we always end each class with three phrases, I matter, you matter, we matter. Um, that comes from the song Powerful. And I think that more now than ever, even if we have not quote unquote learned anything in a class, um, that is the most important thing that they walk away from class. And I agree with Ashley in that, yeah, it is, it is still our job to make sure that we provide equitable education, if not even more importantly so. And then just offering opportunities for students to either record a quick snippet of, of anything. Again, it, it, for me, it's really, music is important, but the kids are more important. 
Um, so if you want to tell me about your favorite thing that happened today, that's cool with me, as opposed to singing a song that I taught you, um, taught you, or that we learned together. Yeah, totally, 100% piggybacking off Alice. And I'm doing the same, like all of the above, exhausted, super tired. <laughs> um, Alice is demonstrating one way to be inclusive, obviously in your classroom online, just like have that background that's representative of your students. Um, the second thing is like student voice, student voice, student voice. Everything should be student driven, right? So like at the beginning of the year, if it's too late for the beginning of the year, just like send out a survey tomorrow. Like what music do you wanna hear? What music do you wanna perform? What are you interested in? Um, I'm in the middle of a protest song unit and a student yesterday in person said, I really wanna learn the guitar. And I just like took a poll. It turns out everyone actually wants to learn guitar because they've been staring at these guitars all day. So I'm like, I guess we're learning guitar now. <laughs> like we're just gonna learn guitar next week as an interlude. And we're gonna try to find a way to incorporate the guitars now into our protest songs. Like it's, it, if you go with the flow, student driven is actually a blessing because it's a lot less planning on our part. It's great. And I would say the last thing is like being okay and comfortable with things not going the way you want them to at all times. I'm seeing a lot in music teacher chats, right? Like in Facebook groups, people being like, but my student doesn't want to turn on the camera. Like, okay, but your student probably has a reason for not wanting to turn on the camera. Like that's okay if your student doesn't have on their camera, right? Maybe one day they can draw a picture of themselves and tape it to the camera. And then you'll feel maybe like you're seeing their beautiful face. Like, I know we miss them. I know we want to hear their voices, but sometimes it's really embarrassing the like living situations they're in. I'm just speaking for my students. Like they've told me that they're embarrassed. Like it's, it's okay. It's okay if it's not going as planned and if you're speaking into a void, as Joe had mentioned to us earlier before any of you arrived. Like, it's a seance and it's weird, but like, be okay with the weird. I want that on a coffee cup or something, like. <laughs> but I just want to touch on something Mia said, um, just in regards, like, getting information from your students. I, I feel remiss in the fact that I didn't mention that from the jump. That is something that I've always done in my programs, especially this year. That was how we figured out what kind of technology our, our students had. Uh, but most importantly, that's how we ended up launching a whole different stream of programming this year. Like we are now doing marketing and branding classes because our kids wanted to learn how to package themselves. And we're like, cool, let's do it. Um, and that's also how we ended up bringing in guest instructors. We're like, well, not like any of our friends in the music industry are working. So I guess we'll call up some friends to join us and then drop their truth and like their knowledge on our students. So it actually like added even more of an interesting structure to being online because now they're like stoked on certain days of the week. They know this is what we're getting because this is exactly what we asked for beyond learning how to create our own music. So it's always like so empowering and like uplifting when you're like, yes, I'm doing the thing that you asked me to do. And you're like really into it. And this is exciting. <laughs> you know, I, I, I often feel that uh, I think the way that we were trained as music educators was very control driven, right? I, te I tell you do, right? And you really have to release the reins. Um, and allow students to speak. I always tell uh, my teachers that the person who's doing the most talking may be possibly be the person doing the most learning. So in your classrooms, are your students talking? Um, they're like, oh, I can't get them to talk. Okay, well, what are you talking about? You know, people can speak to what they know. So are you talking about and connecting to things that your students might know? Um, and even if you don't know um, certain topics or, or genres, just say, okay, so we're listening to maybe this, this rhythm. Have you ever heard this? And just say, oh, let's just make that rhythm on the desk. You know what? And just, where are you? Can, oh, I heard that in the song. This is the song. And even if they hum it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be on, you know, in tune. It doesn't have to be on beat, like it's just connection. And I think that that's one of the most valuable things that we have to talk about is you have to connect to people. People interact and connect with you when you show interest. And if you don't show interest, it's kind of becomes this struggle, right? I'm trying to get you to participate. I'm trying to get you in. And it's like, yeah, but if I don't feel valued, if I don't feel important, if I don't feel like you hear me, um, or connect what we're talking about to what might be valuable to me. Not every day, you know, 
many days, right? Because sometimes there's some minutia, I call it, there's some minutia we got to get through, right? But we can say, let's just get through this minutia so we can really talk and bring that in um, to students. And the, the most incredible thing is that uh, all children have opinions <laughs> um, and they have them quite early on <laughs> and they are not afraid to share. They, are, they become silenced, especially in the walls of our classroom. So we wanna make sure that we, uh, provide them with, with that voice. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we can, can change some things, right? So how can we challenge um, the infusion of diversity in our instruction, right? What's one thing, um, someone who might be here or someone who listens to this later on, what can they take away from your practice? How can they infuse diversity uh, techniques or, or highlight something um, in their day-to-day -day work? Honesty, transparency is what I would say to them. Um, being transparent about even your identity and your culture and where you come from has been really helpful to me. I'm Lebanese, like female and um, queer, like we talked about intersectionality with Ashley. So my students understand that about me and now I've learned so much more about them as a result. And if we're transparent about ourselves, be transparent about the content, okay? like. I see, I see so many people teaching like Whitaker and all these other people, but then like when they touch on Tchaikovsky, like his sexuality all of a sudden doesn't matter. But Clara Schumann is somebody else's wife. Like why does her marital status matter? And like no one else's seems to be mentioned, right? Um, if you're teaching, like I really wanted to mention this because we're in Little Kids Rock, like you've taught queer artists, whether you think you have or not. Like Lizzo even recently went on record and, and said, when it comes to sexuality or gender, I personally don't ascribe to just one thing. I cannot sit here right now and tell you I'm just one thing. That's why the colors for LGBTQ plus are a rainbow because there's a spectrum. And right now we try to keep it black and white. That's just not working for me. Why don't we show them that quote when we do a Lizzo song, you know, just like sprinkle it in. Ask your students, what is diversity? <laughs> Just ask them point blank and see what happens first, um, as opposed to us defining it. I think it goes back to Latasha, what you said about like, I say, you do, I define it, here's what it is. Um, no, like, what does the word, what, what word is in diversity? What does that mean to you? What, what, where have you heard this before? And truly any age. Um, and then I just uh, want to, name once again for us as music educators to get out of the habit of like okay we have now completed the indigenous unit and now we're done we have now completed the queer unit and now we are done i just think that so often we're so used to like okay now the holidays are coming up and now like thanksgiving and now it's valentine's day like um no so that is a very westernized way of considering music because it's not like i stop listening to indigenous music once December comes around or whichever month, right? It's like, I, I can still press play on that playlist, right? So we can still learn that throughout the year. And I think it's so important in terms of diversity to make, to have students make connections. So, okay, so let's say now, you know, September, October, November, it's okay if you have subscribed to the month by month until this point. And then now, okay, so how is it that what we learned in December is now connected to what we have learned before? I think so often we're missing that connection between months, between different units, between different genres. And therefore that's why when, when so many students grow up, they, they just consider, well, classical music and hip hop to, to pick on two very cliche ones are just very, very far away. Like if I, I'm a classically trained pianist, so it is always surprising in a very strange way when I tell people that I um, teach a, a rap class. What? Like, but you're classically trained. And I think that that goes back to also this intersectionality and just different identities that we all have. It is okay to have all of these different connections, these different passions, drives, and I and going back to Mia, this transparency. Like, yeah, I can listen to this and I can also listen to Tchaikovsky and I can listen to Lizzo, right? All of the above. And they can connect to different aspects of what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, what's happening in this moment, just layers and layers. Music really is much more of a web than it is like a timeline. Alice, I'm so glad that you mentioned asking your students about their definition of diversity. Because I, I really feel like as 
and by as I was going to lead into a weird statement, but um, as music educators, like, and, and as humans, I think a lot of folks default to diversity equals race, diversity equals gender. And we get in these really siloed ways of thinking about what these terms actually mean when they have a broad spectrum, spectrum of representation included. Uh, and again, it all comes back to intersectionality. Like we can't stick, keep ourselves in this siloed mindset because it's going to be problematic in the long run. It's not going to be helpful. Um, but I, I actually am one of those individuals, like if someone asks me like what kind of music I perform as a musician, I hate using genres. I'm gonna be honest. Like I, it, it seems disingenuous for us to label every staple type of music in this day and age, just because we can't act like we're creating music and haven't heard all of the different music that has come before us. Like it's, and I say that to the, the students I work with doing jazz. I say that to the students that I work with doing hip hop, you know, like I say that about myself, like I can't act like I haven't heard both Bootsy Collins and Tchaikovsky and like <laughs> make up something based on like what I'm feeling between the two. They can definitely represent like what you're doing and, and how you're feeling. So I, I'm just putting all of that out there just in terms of the kind of free flow thought of my brain right now. <laughs> Ashley, I so appreciate you naming that because it's like this, this obsession with labels is so not what music is. It should not, it's not like we must listen to these different categories. We must subscribe ourselves, our own identities to these different categories. And I think that's a really great reminder when students answer those questions, like the surveys of like, what do you want to listen to? Like your, your answer is also as fluid as it can be or, or as you want it to be. And even if you don't necessarily know what to describe your genre, especially in composing, like, okay, so what genre is it? Instead of that question, it really is like, so what, what inspirations are you drawing from, right? Like, which rhythms did you include if you really want to go that route? Or like, what, what do you feel like you thought about when you made this, comp made this composition? Yeah, I mean, that's just so spot on. I, I even think about it with improvisation. It's like, we ask our students to transcribe different solos and then they come out of jazz programs and you know maybe sound like one artist because all we've done is we've taught them how to transcribe we haven't taught them how to embrace their own ideas or their own thoughts coming through themselves and that is perfectly acceptable to quote like hip-hop music it's perfectly acceptable to quote death metal like it is perfectly acceptable to do any of those things and we just need to start allowing these opportunities for our students to be more fluid in the way that they approach music and music performance and music creation and music composition all of the things that we know that exist in music i think that's the that's really the key the key is uh that we have to release control to allow them to create based on what they know. Like they're not gonna create what they don't know. That's where all great music kind of comes from. Um, I wanna make sure that we get, we have two um, great questions um, and one great comment from our participants. Um, just as a reminder to everyone who's here with us today, there will be a recording of this session um, and it will be released later on this month um, from the LKR's uh, team. So if you have friends that you'd love to hear uh, the expertise of these lovely ladies, please feel free to uh, look out for that announcement. Uh, we have uh, one comment that I thought was great. This is from Kenneth Murphy. Um, he shared that um, he has um, a song about backpacks um, and he has his students share their backpacks and they talk about what's in those backpacks and allows them to showcase them. Um, and that's a wonderful way to say like, it's really what our students bring with them, right? Um, and we want the essence of what they bring to us uh, to shine because their essence makes the learning environment um, and experience richer. Um, I'd like to take two of our questions that we have and give it to the panel. I'm excited because one of the questions I know this person. Hi, Keith. Thanks for listening in and joining us. Uh, this is from Keith Bush. His question is, how do you suggest teachers present culturally diverse art or music in their instruction without seeming condescending? 
I'm going to go straight in. The first thing to make sure is to not other the music. And when I say not other, I mean not saying like, this is a foreign music or this is a, like just presenting it in a way that you wouldn't present other as other kinds of music, I suppose. It should be represented in or introduced in that same genuine, precious holding way that you hold whatever is your favorite music or your culture's music. And I think that um, similar to, I think what Mia has mentioned before, like our students can just tell off the bat how you feel about that music, whatever that music is. And it's just so important not to present it in that way. So that's a not to do. Um, and then a to do is to, to make sure that you are researching from a culture bearer. So I say that meaning there's a lot of information out there, some inaccurate. And I think when I say do your research, I mean, reach out to a culture bearer, pay them for their labor, and then ask, bear, like, ask your questions that you want to about the music. How do you pronounce this? How do you, like, what is the symbolism behind whatever this, this aspect of the culture is? And then finally, if they're up for it, it's always so great to have a culture bearer come visit the class, even if it's through um, Zoom or in any virtual capacity that you can. So those are my quick bits of thought. I'm so glad you just mentioned culture bearers. Um, I'm always for bringing in your community members, your elders into your classroom to, to drop some wisdom. Um, I also should note that I use multiple terms for culture bearers. I use the term culture bearer, but I also use tradition bearer and most frequently we'll use elder. Uh, and I, I just wanna note that just because a lot of our culture bearers, some of them take fault with the term culture bearer because they, they feel like it makes them old. <laughs> um, and this just comes from working with a, a bunch of wonderful practi cultural practitioners in the New Orleans area. This literally comes from the 93 year old individuals that I work with who tell me that they don't wanna feel older than they are. And I was like, but you're 93. Um, so that was a sidebar there, <laughs> but um, as it relates to bringing in music or art into your classroom, I also recommend figuring out and learning how this style of music is normally taught or presented. So I'm going to bring myself back to New Orleans, bring myself back to the jazz traditions. So often, and, and for a large part of my career, I've been asked to provide sheet music for traditional jazz tunes, for traditional brass band tunes. I'll tell you what, we don't write that down. We don't, <laughs> it's all ear training. And so to ask for sheet music, while I know that some students learn better with sheet music, it's disingenuous to the music itself. It doesn't allow for an opportunity to learn, to listen, to experience in that moment with one another. So I highly suggest doing your research on the way that this music is taught as well, in addition to the history of the music itself. So making sure you do your research there is so crucial. And I feel like you're referring a lot to appropriation as well in that question, potentially. And honestly, please don't let that hold you back. I see Kat Stock is here right now and Kat, Kat approached me and said like, I want to start a GSA, like just go and do it. Like she's so awesome for doing that. She's so awesome for like approaching me. Like, do you know how grateful I was for that? Like I, just go and like jump in because mm -hmm. I grew up in Detroit where the Arab population was ginormous. And I have never once heard Arab, Arabic music ever once in my classroom, ever. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's insane to me. And like, um, I hate to get heavy, but like I just had lunch with like my old best friend's boyfriend and he, um, he is like really addicted to drugs now, honestly, because he went through his whole childhood being gay and never once having an, an adult acknowledge and love him for it. Like his family was not there and very supportive. And he had so many opportunities for teachers to step up and like be a safe space. And he never once got that. And it's just like, I'm not saying that's wholly the reason he's addicted, but like it definitely contributed to that. And um, he was on a full ride scholarship getting his PhD at Harvard and year, year six is when this all like happened to him. And 
if, if he had one professor or one teacher just like acknowledge his identity, I just think things might have been different. Like you could be saving a life. It sounds extreme, but it's true. Yeah, it's so relevant. I, I mean, I, I look at this, um, when you talk about culturally diverse without seeming condescending, I mean, I think that there's a sense of vulnerability that we expect from children. Um, and as adults, we don't offer. Um, and I'm one of those people, I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know how this worked. Does anybody know how this worked? And it's a lot of times I do that. And when I have that conversation, when I really don't know, people are just like, oh, well, I could tell you a little bit about this. Because what you wind up finding out a lot of times when you just ask the question, you say, oh, well, you've got all this wealth of knowledge that you don't even know that you have. And I think that people do get nervous. Um, I mean, that tells us what? we're clearly not prepared as, as professionals to do what we're doing. We've gotta be open. Like I'm sitting here thinking like Mia, I'm like, we don't have Arabic music in mind. I gotta change my curriculum, that's it, right? Because I know I now have Arabic students and it's not just that, I want you to hear it. And I don't want you to hear it in the disingenuous, like, and please tell me if I'm being, like genie type of reference because that's what's, kind of shared, right? I don't want it to be in that. I mean, I have friends and we go to parties and I go to clubs and it's amazing, but no one hears that. And so I think like all of our panelists have said, get out there, say it, um, show it. If you don't know, you have four people here who are saying, hey, call me, Facebook me, tweet me, text me, uh, pigeon, send it we will help you. And if we don't know, we'll find somebody who does, um, who can support you. Just make the effort. Our last question from our panel is, um, thank you. Thank you, Ashley, for sharing that out for sure. Um, thank you, Mia, also for sharing that out. I got to break those down for myself. Um, our last question says, have you ever had trouble getting a piece of music approved as curriculum because of its cultural or ethnic association? If you have, how have you dealt with effectively doing so? I, I'm gonna jump in because I'm the person who approves curriculum for my district. Um, and so I find that teachers tend to forget what you have to do. You don't walk in there saying, I just wanna do this. Walk in with a strong proposal, put your stuff on paper, ask for a meeting, explain the cultural re relevance, the ethnic relevance, how it connects to true standards and skills and techniques, Go in there armed where somebody can't say no. Because when we say it in that way and we present it in that way, administrators have to, I have to come up with something because it's already done and written out. So when you go in, be clear and organized. If you don't know how to do that, then it's just a simple proposal. You can Google any proposal for that and just say, here's what we're trying to do. And you can link this back to the work of Gloria uh, Billings, who does culturally responsive teaching. Quote some people, put, listen, add an article, add some research on that. You know, that's the age that we live in. And if we wanna be taken as professionals and help people understand the importance, you gotta drop it like that too. Panel, what are your thoughts? Yes, be knowledgeable. Like just, I know we're adding to our plates are already so full underpaid plates. I know <laughs> we're so mean. <laughs> and I also love that Alice mentioned musical explorers. Um, it's cause like it does the research for you. I, I know cause I worked there and I worked on their curriculum for musical explorers and there is some translation in the Arab portion that I did wrong. So if you need the right, correct one, I will fix it for you. <laughs> Ashley's like cracking up. <laughs> but yes, those like pre-researched programs and curriculums exist too. I um, don't have trouble with getting things approved, but I did want to just throw in and say that if there is the fear or hesitation that, oh no, I have to now add something to my curriculum, surely there's a lot that you can take out because this is critical to a student's identity. I mean, that was just like truth right there. Uh, <laughs> I, the only thing I was going to end on from my end is I haven't had issues with bringing in 
uh, music into my curriculum, especially when I made the transition into nonprofits where I got to design my own curriculum. And same applies with curriculums that I have designed for um, other institutions. But I, you know, I, I will say sometimes begging for forgiveness after the fact works too. You know, I, I'm just saying like, it's cool. <laughs> um, I, you know, let's be honest, how many times do they, they actually know what's happening in your classroom? I, I also am admitting that as well. Look at all these things that I'm saying. Sorry, little kids rock. Um, <laughs> Before I forget, final thing that I, I just thought of is please invite families when you do do this in your lessons, um, especially on, on virtual learning and just having that connection. And if you are getting corrected by the parents, that's totally cool. That's that vulnerability that I think students will just so very much appreciate. And then just being able to have that lens that you might not otherwise get. So we just talked about openness honesty, vulnerability, research, expertise, and a willing to learn. Uh, thank you, thank you so much to Mia and Alex and Ashley. Absolutely awesome knowledge, expertise. These, we have some of the best. We're very, very fortunate. And of course, thank you to Little Kids Rock, um, to the team, Joe and Brandon, um, no, Braden, for allowing us to be here, uh, to be there. And thank you to each of our attendees. Thank you so much for coming to support us um, and help us. We're on a mission to do some amazing things, to shift um, the conversation and evolve the conversation in music education. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, please stay safe, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, and we look forward to seeing you guys um, at the next one. So be well. Yeah. I definitely have a, a few um, announcements, but like I need a moment because like, thank you all. Thank you, all the panelists, Mia, Alice, Ashley, Latasha. Um, yeah, seriously, we're blowing our minds with your knowledge and experiences. I mean, it's like super valuable. Um, thank you behind the scenes to Braden um, for helping. Um, and we're gonna spend the next couple hours picking up all those mic drops that, were, that happened around this last hour. Um, we really hope that uh, everyone today la are, is leaving with a renewed lens and seeing our students um, and providing a welcoming environment. Um, thank you to our live audience. Um, feel free to continue the conversation in the Little Kids Rock Teacher Facebook group. We'll also have an open discussion session tomorrow at 6 p.m. Um, the link can be found in your weekly resources email. Um, and as Latasha said, we'll be rebroadcasting this event as well as the previous um, panel on remote learning later this month in case you miss any of these events. So keep out a lookout for that. Um, our next teacher expert panel in December will be, be focusing on performance strategies, especially in this ever changing school year. So I know people will be interested in that. Um, we'll be joined by another set of expert teachers addressing that topic. Um, we have a couple more community events this month. Stop by next Friday for Little Kids Rock Office Hours with myself and Mr. Tony Souza on Friday, November 20th. And lastly, to spice things up for Thanksgiving, uh, we'll be hosting our next teacher meetup on Thursday, November 19th at 7 p.m. Eastern with Argentinian chef Fran, who will be leading us in making empanadas from scratch. Um, there will be limited seats available for that one. So once that pops up, make sure you sign up for that. Again, find out any more information about these events in our weekly curriculum resources email. If you have any questions, feel free to send them over to program at Little Kids Rock. Again, thank you everyone for attending. Have a great week and see you next time.